Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. Joining us now, as he does on the first Monday of every month in the 10 o'clock hour, is Dr. Michael Lake, the senior pastor of Biblical Life Assembly. He's also the chancellor and founder of Biblical Life College and Seminary and serves as an educational consultant for various Christian organizations around the world. He's the author of the best-selling books, The Shinar Directive, Preparing the Way for the Son of Perdition, The Shirith Imperative, Empowering the Remnant to Overcome the Gates of Hell, and his latest book, The Kingdom Priesthood, Preparing and Equipping the Remnant Priesthood for the Last Days. Dr. Lake is known for his where the rubber meets the road preaching style, and he brings a wealth of theological and biblical concepts into the realm of how do we really live them into the life of the believer. His goal is to help believers to be strengthened and to honor God by living His Word in every situation in life. You can find out more about him at KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. Here to co-host this Kingdom Intelligence Hour is our good friend, Dr. Michael Lake. Michael, welcome to your Kingdom Intelligence Hour here in Season 5 of Revealing the Truth. It's great to be back with you. Uh, it was interesting. We, had, we were all geared up for last week and then... Uh, the police kind of did their thing out there on one of the highways in your area, so we didn't get to do an episode. So um, I'm glad to be back. I'm fired up. God's doing some things in the midst of all the craziness that's going on in the world. The things that are going on uh, are perplexing to so many, but when you boil it down, it's all prophetic. But there are so many being distracted by the, the prophetic aspects that they're neglecting the fundamentals that as long as today is today, we're to be about the Father's business. We're supposed to be preaching the gospel. We're supposed to be, and, and so, so many people are so focused on uh, the tribulation and the rapture theologies and, and all of these other things and the, the camps that are forming that are kind of a, uh, offspring of the missed prophecies of so many in regards to who was going to get elected. Now they're jumping on to uh, what are the signs that while well, the uh, pre-trib, mid-trib, uh, pan-trib, uh, all that stuff is taking everybody's eyes off of advancing the gospel. And Pew just came out with a report that was so stunning that said that Christianity is down 20%. In America, we've now dropped to the lowest level of what people identify as in the modern era. And the group that identifies as nuns, N-O-N-E-S, has risen to 20% of those surveyed. And so the gospel message is being stifled uh, by this total lean towards looking at just the prophetic. Well, I, I think there's a lot that have refused to look at the prophetic, too, that has also caused the downturn. I think what we're seeing is the failure of the American gospel. And notice I, I had stipulated American gospel, not kingdom gospel. On, on the one hand, we have much of the church ignores Bible prophecy completely. They, they ignore your walk with God as an individual. They ignore so many things because it has become a Laodicean gospel. Because of that, we have several generations that the church overall has failed. They are disinterested. They don't want gimmicks. They don't want hyperbole. Uh, they don't want, and there's a lot of things, in, in unless they were supposed to be moving prophetically or moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, there are a lot of gimmicks that we use because to be truthful, they would know the Holy Spirit if he came up and slapped him upside the head. And, and we're, we're calling that church, and it has failed generations that are not interested. But, brother, at the same time, we are seeing unprecedented numbers of non-churched people reading the book of Revelation more than ever before. Uh, one of the things I was taken aback at when this whole pandemic started was that, you know, you, you would walk in and you couldn't find toilet paper, you couldn't find a napkin, you couldn't find Kleenex anywhere. You know, you, you go from Walmart to Walmart or from store to store. What's interesting uh, is that uh, from, from Walmart to Mardell's many times, you couldn't find a Bible either. Because people that had never read the Word of God started saying, I remember Grandma talked about times like these. 
and they started picking up the word of God. And so there's there's opportunity in in spite of our failure. At the same time, guys, I do not read anywhere in the word it's saying, okay, now that you see that end time prophecy is about to be fulfilled, you go down and you sit down and you quit working. That does not exist in the word of God. And, you know, my attitude, when you, when you talk about, you know, Jesus even talking about the, the harpazo, he said, listen, one will be out, they're, they're out in the field working. They're not sitting back at home twiddling their thumbs saying, oh, just any minute now, the Lord's going to come back. They're out in the field working. One would be taken, one would be left. So we're supposed to occupy until he comes. My, my goal is not to accurately define the day that Jesus is going to come back. There, there is not an extra prize in heaven. Oh, you were pre-trib and you were correct. You were mid-trib and you were correct. You were post-trib and you were correct. Here's an extra crown just for you. That doesn't happen. What happens is did I get my kingdom assignments accomplished before he comes? That's all that matters. You know, you can be completely wrong eschatologically about the timing. Let's say, you know, I, I tell my friends that are pre-tribbers, I tell them, I said, listen, if this thing happens the way that you say it, and so I leave all my provisions and things that I have kind of prepared, you know, to, to, to work through some things, if, if we're mid-trib or whatever, and we're going up through the cloud, what I left means absolutely nothing to me, and I will give you a high five on the way out of here. But what happens... If I'm right, and because you haven't prepared, you're, you run short. You see, there's, and not only run short in taking care of our individual needs, but, but running short on, boy, I wish I could have done this for Jesus. I should have done this. I wish I could have done that. That, that is no time for, for wishing that you could have done something. I want to be like the Apostle Paul when the Lord when the Lord says yo and it's time to go. I want to have that. I have run the race. I have finished the fight. There's not another thing left that I can do for the kingdom. Everything that He gave me to do, I accomplished when I check out of here. Whether it's I close my eyes in death as an old man, or that He calls me home, I want to be able to say I finished it all by His grace in my life. Amen. And that's what matters. Amen. <clears throat> I met with a group last night uh, for the very first time that I met with them. Uh, it was a group of women who are being led by a good friend of mine, and they wanted to kind of get an uh, overview. And that was exactly the message I delivered, that there's five camps. 20% are in each camp. That means 80% yeah. are wrong. You can't have five differing positions and all be right. So if, if we set that to the side and say, listen, I can't do anything about it. I have no impact on the when. I can't accelerate the time frame. I can't decelerate the time frame. I have no effect on it whatsoever. Therefore, like the parable of the 10 virgins, I am to be ready with my lamp filled and not be concerned about rushing around when I'm surprised by what unfolds, but to be prepared. Oh, yeah. And, and when, when you look at the, 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 the whole concept, because everything Jesus taught around, there's a really neat video uh, that Kevin Sarbo narrated, and it was discoveries about the Canaanite wedding, which was unique uh, in all of Israel. And they would literally sleep with their wedding garments on at night because they did not know the day or the hour. It was the father of the, house, of, the, of the groom's household that said, okay, now that you have everything ready, you have the feast ready, you got everything ready, I will tell you the time. And so, uh, there, was, so there was a time when they were, they were fully prepared, and then there was a time beyond that. And I think the time beyond that is seeing just how dedicated we are. Okay, Lord, I'm ready for you to come back. Okay, that's great, but you know what? You may have another 30 years. What are you going to do now that you that you say that you're ready? What are you What are you going to be doing? Are you still going to be about your father's business? And we also miss the point. Within you know, Jesus, his answer to the Laodicean church was actually the marriage covenant. That's what you know. I stand at the door and knock. That's him and his father standing at the door and knock, ready to hash out the ketubah. 
and we, we, we get so excited about, oh, man, in my father's house there's many mansions, and if it wasn't so, I would. We get all excited about that, but we forget the other half of the conversation. The groom says, okay, this is what I'm called to do. Okay, he's the king of the universe. He rules and reigns in a Hebrew court. All these different things. And we get all excited about that. But then when he finishes, the family of the woman, they would come and say, okay, now what does she need to learn and what does she need to become so that she can work with you in your administration? We forget all about that. That's the part of us becoming now. We, we need to develop kingdom muscle in our lives and, and where we're at now brother is it's not a time of riding on the coattails or the apron strings of a past generation or your pastor or anybody else protection provision and everything is going to be based on your individual walk with god in the future between now and when the lord comes back and that is what we have missed we have been that La that laodicean church thinking you know we live in america where it even brother even the poorest of us those of us that are living on welfare that just barely make it from day to day are rich compared to much of the rest of the world okay and we we have trusted in those riches we've trusted in all these things that babylon can provide but those things can be taken away in an instant but what can't be taken away is what the kingdom can provide and that's what that's what Jesus was talking about. It, it's there's there's this. I, I I think we have to have a, a paradigm change. We need to realize that we have been under the new world order, the one that's dying out to be replaced by the next one. And I think there has been new new world orders ever since Nimrod. Okay, there've been one after another after another after another. That's what that statue was about in Daniel's vision: is all these different new world orders building on on the other ones. Uh, the one that was established after World War II is being replaced. In fact, the, there, there have been people that were a part of it, leaders that were part of it, saying this new world order is dying. Now there has been a war going on with the, with the, with the elite because their plan was we want to move all the wealth out of America. That's why they moved all the manufacturing out of America to China. China was supposed to hold that wealth for a little bit so they could do this metaphoric uh, dying, and then America was going to rise as the phoenix, okay? What they didn't count on is that the elite in, in the Orient said, well, once we get it, we're going to keep it. And so there has been this, this war, if you will, even before the stuff that's going on now and the rise of the CCP, and, and I think everything, I think they have actually purchased half of our politicians, which makes them political prostitutes because they were supposed to represent the people, not corporations, not all these other things. Uh, and we, we see all that going on. And so they're trying to reestablish another new world order. And we're freaking out about it. But let me tell you something. The body of Christ has survived many new world orders. What, was the, what helped them was their personal walk with God. They developed spiritual kingdom muscle. And I, I think one of the things, especially in the charismatic church, that is, is so misinterpreted is Isaiah 10, 27. In fact, uh, God had me do two things this year. Every once in a while he'll say, okay, I want you to switch the version of the Bible that you're reading through. And I, I try to stick with the ones that are more transliteral. You know, uh, King James, New King James, NASB, uh, the New English version, ones that aren't more, they don't tend to be paraphrased, but they are, they're more literal. And so I'm reading through, and he says, I want you to read through the prophets. And so I have, I have been just enjoying the book of Isaiah here lately. And I noticed that Isaiah 10, 27 was, was interpreted different than the King James. And brother, that's when I, when I see the difference in the interpretation, I begin digging down. That's where I found the pure gold for me. Okay, now the King James says, and it shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from off, his, uh, off thy shoulders and his yoke from off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. And the uh, traditional Pentecostal charismatic way of interpreting that is you need to find an anointed minister, and if he's really anointed, that his anointing will destroy that yoke 
that's over your shoulders. Okay. Now, when I looked it up, and again, the uh, the NASB com- translates it completely different. That last part of that verse says, "And the yoke will be broken because of fatness." And so, I you, ha- you have to step back. You know, I don't need to tell you this, but our, our listeners that. Hebrew is a very picturesque language. It, it paints a picture uh, that, as, as you either read it or you're speaking. And Isaiah was painting a prophetic picture. And in verse 20 of the same chapter, uh, it says, In that day the remnant of Israel and those of the house of Jacob who have escaped will never again rely upon the one that struck them, the New World Order system, but will truly rely on the Lord the Holy One of Israel. So in the midst of oppression and bondage, they're learning to trust in God. And that's where we are right now. In the actual Hebrew text, it adds in uh, Isaiah 10, 20, it adds the words, Bamet, in truth. So the passage reads in the Hebrew, and it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such of the house of Jacob who have escaped shall no more re- again rely upon him who struck them, but, sh- but shall rely upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. I need to write that down. So it's, V'chayav ayom ha'hu le'osif od sha'ar Israel u'leftat. Beit Yaakov lehishan al mekehu venishan al Adonai kidosh Yisrael beamet. In truth. Truth. So see, I didn't take the time see, to look see, it up in Hebrew this morning. Right, and so that that just hammers it. Just hammers it because there's even today in the social media battle that's going on between teachers. And it's one that kind of vexes me. It's one that I think vexes you as well. Uh, You and I have known each other for a long time. We have a great deal of respect for each other. We travel in a particular circle of friends, peers, that in some cases we agree with them, in other cases we don't agree with them. But there is such love there is such an open, willing dialogue to say, well, you know, let's go to the text. The, ca- the text does not say absolutely this. Therefore, your supportive evidence for your position is this. My supportive evidence is my is right here, and we come to agree to disagree. But have such respect and say, yeah, both of those are very possible. The terms right and wrong have never entered a discussion that you and I have had, and we've had, what, how many hours and hours and hours together? But it's the truth of the text. And if the text establishes it, it's not up for debate. It lays it out clearly. That's the clear contextual right interpretation of the Scripture in context. And so when we do that, we look at the condition of the, the people who are under at the time, and now we're seeing that they are going to be, one, set free. Two, in truth. And three, that they cannot rest on anyone other than themselves and the Lord. Yes. Which is the way it's been all along, but we've become complacent by resting on the faith of another on the leadership of the church, on whatever doctrine is being tickling our ears that we like that makes us feel good as opposed to strengthens us in the Word. And, you know, this actually bursts our our paradigm bubble because they learn to trust in God before the yoke is broken. Because what he's painting here is a picture. Okay, they're, they're, they're under the bondage of Babylon. They're under the bondage of the, the Assyrians for those that, uh, of, of, of Israel that had escaped in, in Judah. And so they, they have the oppression of that new world order that was on them in the midst of that bondage and from them being reduced to basically a beast of burden with the yoke and the burden of 
because look, guys, we need to understand what the, we, we see the principle in Egypt. This new world order, none of this can do anything except it has to draw from the blessing that's on God's people. That's it. And they try to turn us into a beast of burden uh, so that we can support whatever they're wanting to do. Even though at the same time they fear us, they hate us, they also rely upon what that blessing produces. That, that's why the children of Israel went from being the real blessing in Egypt to the slaves of Egypt. You'll see that pattern over and over and over again. But in the midst of that, if I will say, you know what, I'm not trusting in the system in America. Uh, Washington, D.C. has gone absolutely stark raven mad. That's the, they are drunk on, on the wine from the whore of Babel. I mean, they are, this, some of the things they're, they're trying to push is absolutely the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. I can't depend on them. I've got to depend on the Lord and the Lord alone, regardless of the bondage that's in my life. The bondage does not hinder my understanding of learning how to trust in God. That propensity is there regardless of the bondage. But where the enemy gets me off is I start trusting in people. Well, you know, if if Eric is anointed enough, I can get free under his ministry. If if Mike is anointed enough, I can get free under his ministry. But how about going to the one with the capital T H E, the anointing, Jesus of Nazareth, going to Messiah. And as I learn to trust in him and him alone, now I can I can enjoy his servants and the ministries they have, but my trust is in him alone. As I do that, you see, you can see the, the the transformation of this this half-starved oxen. That because they're learning to trust in God, he begins to grow, and he grows strong, and he grows fat. And it's the the anointing within, not the anointing without. It's the anointing within that grows to the place it snaps the yoke off of his neck. That's why the most accurate translation I think is found in the NASB and it's in many of the newer translations that the yoke is destroyed because of the fatness, the fatness of the ox that the, that it was laid upon. And so we got, we got to change our paradigms. God can use a lot of servants to help us learn to trust in God alone. But Eric, what we've done is we've put all these preachers up on a pedestal. I, I tell I tell the people at, at KIB and Biblical Life TV, please do not put me on a pedestal. Don't don't ever do it. Number one, I know my own human frailties, but number two, if you do that, the only thing God can do for your sake is to knock me off. Don't put me up someplace I don't belong because I don't want to have to go through getting knocked off so that you can get your your vision right. All of us are servants. We have good days. We have bad days. All of us have our own struggles. And we, and all of us, have marveled at how what God can do when He can get us to get ourselves out of the way so that He can just move. We, we, set marveled at it. It's not that boy, I'm somebody, and God can use me, and He just needs to make space for me. When, when I'm really preaching under the anointing, or, or God, or God uses me to give a prophetic word, He moved Mike Lake out of the way. And then after it's done, I sat there with my jaw open, thinking, Lord, I can't believe what you did. Look what you did. Because, you know, I've heard me preach when I didn't have the anointing, and I would rather hear uh, fingernails going down a chalkboard. But, man, if I can just learn to get out of the way and just let you move, that, that's where it happens. And, and so all of us are in this journey together. We, we have giftings, we have different things, but it's, but it, we, we, it's almost like the Ronco shopping network. You know, I didn't really get free under Mike Lake, so I'm going to go down here and I'm going to listen to Carl Gollops for a while. If I don't get it there, I'm going to listen to Tom Horn. If I'm not going to get there, I'm going to go listen to Eric Walker. All of us have a portion of what we're supposed to do for God that is supposed to strengthen your individual walk with God. That can be built in the midst of your bondage and you're to grow to the place that you grow up so big in God in spite of the bondage that that bondage can no longer hold you and it is broken by what God has done in your life over the course of time.
What I see is that <clears throat> as I stand before these groups, uh, I'm in front of a group every Monday night in Tuscaloosa, and I say the same thing. I said, this is study to show yourself approved, yeah. not study to show sure. me approved. You're not here to open your Bible to see whether or not I learned, I got it, I studied, I put in the time. You're to take what I give you and you're to take it home and line it up with Scripture. And I've issued yeah. the same challenge for 20 years. If there's something that I've said that is not out of the Bible, you come to me with an open Bible and you show me where I'm in error. Because I return to the Word of God. I can't go too far astray by preaching the Word of God in trying to explain illustratively or expositorily uh, the various examples, God gives us in his own word the pictures to use that he's chosen to exemplify the message. In this case, we're talking about fatness. We're talking about the ox. We're talking about the yoke. We're talking about the individual. It's not talking about the farm or the industry or the culture, it's talking about the person. And we are to grow in this so that we are so anointed, we are so flowing in this fatness, not of fatness of sloth and not this fatness of, of, of gluttony, but this fatness of the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that the yoke snaps from our backs, right? and we are set free. And what does Scripture tell us? You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We're talking with Dr. Michael Lake <clears throat> for this Kingdom Intelligence Hour. You can find more about him at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com as we do talk to him on the first Monday of every month in the 10 o'clock hour. We're talking about uh, uh, the strength and the power and the anointing that God has for each one of us, but it is an individual mandate. It is not a church mandate. It is not a denomination mandate. It's a personal mandate, and one in which we must accept in order to grow in the admonition of the Lord and be about the Father's business. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, host of Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Revealing Prophecy, seen every week on the Igniting Nation Broadcasting Network. Our daily on-demand programming is available on our Apple and Android apps, and on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and Android TV. We broadcast live Monday through Friday through our apps, on our website, IgnitingNation.com, and on Facebook Live. You can listen daily on our audio platforms on Spotify, iTunes, TuneIn, and iHeart. Our lineup of best-selling authors bring you the most in-depth biblical insights into the most pressing issues of our time, including prophecy, Israel, spiritual warfare, and a wide variety of contemporary Christian issues impacting the body of Messiah around the globe. If you missed the live show, you can always catch up on the Igniting Nation YouTube channel. Follow us on social media and join us as we endeavor to heal the nations with the Word of God. With today's smartphone technology, news, information, sports, and entertainment is widely available and almost unbounded. But what about the information that believers in Yeshua are looking for? Well, now there's an app for that. Igniting a Nation now has apps available for Android and iPhone. With our app, you'll gain access to everything you would in our website, from our featured guests to our live streaming shows. Visit Google Play or the Apple Store and download Igniting a Nation's new app today. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker inviting you to study right by my side through the Biblical Truth Library. Imagine having access to over 1,000 hours of audio and video teachings available to you through our website on a subscription basis or via our Apple and Android apps on an a la carte basis. Whichever method you choose, we promise to deliver new insights into the living Word of God as seen through the eyes of a Jewish believer. 
If you hunger and thirst like millions around the world for a deeper walk with God and the revelation of new understanding of the scriptures, visit IgnitingAnation.com and click on the Biblical Truth Library or on any device with our free app. Don't let another day go by without receiving your heart's desire for a new depth of understanding into all of God's Word. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker inviting you to join me and my special featured guests twice per month with Rabbi Zeb Parat and Carl Gallops and monthly with Dr. Michael Heiser, Dr. Michael Lake, Dr. Timothy Jennings, Dr. Mark Baker, Dr. Jeffrey Johnson, Drs. Michelle and Mark Sherwood, Dr. Kim Moss, Derek Gilbert, Peter Rosenberger, Brandon Gallops, Steve Fair, Stephen Black for in-depth insights into Israel prophecy, the unseen realm, the brain, spiritual warfare, overcoming shame, mysteries of the Bible, prophetic insights, the sensational and the supernatural, caregiving, addiction recovering, understanding the divided heart, same-sex attraction, and much more. We're proud to feature some of the greatest biblical minds from both Israel and around the United States. Check out our featured guest lineup and 24-7 feed on IgnitingAnation.com or watch by topic on any device with our free apps. If you can't find what you need, you're just not looking in the right place. Follow us on social media and download our free apps today. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker inviting you to join me and Israel's number one rated guide, Edo Kanan, for our annual Israel trip. Our 2022 trip is now open for registration for our 18th trip to Israel. Our trip will take us from Tel Aviv to the Galilee, down to the Dead Sea, and four nights in Jerusalem. You will walk where Yeshua walked and watch the Bible turn from black and white to living color. Visit ignitinganation.com forward slash events and download the registration form today. No, it's not too early to take advantage of our payment plan designed to fit any budget. All of our trips sell out, and we want you to experience this life-changing journey. Registration is now open for April 2nd to 13th, 2022. And we promise you, you will never read your Bible the same way again. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and as we do on the first Monday of every month in the 10 o'clock hour, we meet with our good friend, Dr. Michael Lake. Uh, you can find more about him at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Mike, welcome back to the program. It's great to be back with you, Eric. You know, as we look at uh, people taking on this personal responsibility, uh, it requires a certain measure of wisdom, uh, one which uh, is um, often lacking, but yet there seems to be uh, this assumed shortcut as you read in the book of James, it says, well, if anybody lacks wisdom, just ask for it. Well, that's not really a shortcut. That's actually like in Monopoly you've picked the card and it says go to jail go to directly to jail do not pass go do not collect two hundred dollars what he's doing is he's actually sending you back to proverbs which king solomon writes that the beginning of wisdom is fear of the lord you have to go through the process you have to in order to obtain this gift of wisdom you have to have this awe, this reverent fear of the Lord. It's not a vending machine. It's not the quick answer. And I think people have gotten to a position where it's, uh, uh, oh, I don't, I don't have wisdom. I'll just ask for it. Well, they're not, the, the answer is coming, but if you're not in the place in which it's coming to, God tells you the place is going to be coming. It's going to come out when you're on your knees, when you're on your face, when you're laid prostrate before the Lord in awe and reverent fear of Him. Yeah. That's the position in which you'll receive that wisdom. But if you're just driving in your nice car and driving down the road and you just ask for it, well, you're not in the, actually in the position to receive it, are you? No, you're not. Uh, you know, in fact, with, with dealing with the anointing, uh, we can jump to Isaiah chapter 11 where it talks about the, the sevenfold anointing of Messiah. And in, in fact, um, you know, when we read the book of Revelation, we, we see something interesting in the 
uh, King James Version, it talks about the seven spirits of God. First of all, there are not seven spirits. There are not seven Holy Spirits. Uh, in, in fact, in my, my book, uh, The Kingdom Priesthood, I go and, and, and draw from uh, Greek scholars that say the most accurate translation is the sevenfold Spirit of God because there are seven things that the Spirit of God does as He begin to work in our life. And it's that, that anointing that breaks the yoke that fatness that we have is because we're drawing it from Messiah. And Isaiah deals with this. Uh, in Isaiah chapter uh, 11, it says, And then a root shall spring forth uh, of Jesse, the, a branch from his roots will bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. That was one of the first things that we see in the ministry of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord rested upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. Now, the fear of the Lord, when you go back and read it through in the Word, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In fact, if you want to get the angels to encamp round, round about you for safety, they only encamp round about those that fear the Lord. But he doesn't stop there. And in the, in the NASB, it says, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he'll no longer judge with the seeing of his eyes or the hearing of his ears. So he's no longer judging by his physical senses. That the fear of the Lord, uh, the King James says he is quick in the fear of the Lord. But to have that delight in the fear of God, that's one of the things that I think we need to begin praying is, Lord, teach me to fear you. Teach me to give you the respect that you deserve because that is foundational for everything. And, and brother, the hyper grace and the way that we have preached the gospel, uh, it, it, there, is, there is a familiarity with God that we have turned them almost into a supernatural Santa Claus rather than absolutely fearing or giving him the respect that is due. I mean, the, the one that we serve spoke and the universe came into existence. He is the cause for the Big Bang. And by the way, the, the whole concept scientifically of the Big Bang is impossible, that you're telling me all matter was compressed down into something the size of a BB and then exploded and put forth galaxies of existence? I mean, I, I thought the Bible was hard to believe. I just recently read a blog where <clears throat> concurrent with Israel being formed in 1948, 1948 was the year of the birth of the Big Bang Theory. Yeah. So many things happened that year that uh, we look back on and see that it was a catalyst for so much, but that was one of the things that happened. So that's how, that's how modern that is. Uh, it's as modern as the ABC, NBC, and CBS uh, broadcast of that began broadcasting that same year. So, you know, now you have this vehicle that comes out the same time that these false theories come out, but now you have a medium in order to spread them, and we can see how this disinformation begins. And, and the, the whole, you know, we're beginning to understand that what we thought was empty space is something called dark matter. And so there is actually no empty space at all. And they're, they're, brother, they're, they're actually, they're, their paradigm will not allow them to be reverenced toward God. That they're, they're finding self-correcting software in the background of the universe. Why? Is it's upheld by the word of his power. That the word that he spoke forth in that creative process, if the enemy tries to, to corrupt it, there is correcting software in the background to correct it. Uh, and this is the God that we have to serve. When we, when we come back with Jesus, we're riding white horses, we're there to witness. It's, it's like Moses taking the children of, e of Israel out of Egypt. They didn't have to lift a sword. The Bible says that the enemy will be destroyed at the brightness of his coming. All he has to do is show up and they're vanquished. That's the God that we have to deal with. That's who we serve. And yet we, we have made him commonplace. We have, we have made him, if we really knew, and in fact, I see a transition. I'm, I'm loving the book of Isaiah. 
because Isaiah started out as a good preacher, preaching righteousness. In the year that King Uzziah dies, he has a vision, and he sees the Lord for who he is. His train fills the temple, and if you don't really understand what that means, uh, did you ever see like you know King Arthur and all that? They would have like this long robe behind them, and then you'd, you'd have uh, some prince somewhere, and it would barely reach the middle of his back because the length of that represented the size of his domain. And when you see the Lord, the size of his domain, he is Merach Olam. He is the king of the universe. When Isaiah sees that, he's not saying, oh, man, we're having church now. Woo-hoo. He says, I am undone. I have seen the Lord, and dude, I'm still alive. I can't believe it. But I, I realize the depths of my sin and that I am a man of unclean lips. A preacher of righteousness is saying that he had unclean lips, and I serve a people of unclean lips. And that's when the coal is taken off the altar and he is cleansed. But in that moment, I believe that Isaiah truly learned the fear of the Lord. When he saw the Lord as he really is. You know, one of the things, Eric, that I'm doing is when I'm trying to, I want to see Jesus as he is now. I do not read the Gospels. I read the book of Revelation. I believe the book of Revelation is the fifth gospel, but it was written to a church that forgot who they were serving. Mm-hmm. And yeah, when I right. see him, that just the very side of him, and it's John. John is the one that at the Last Supper leaned his head over on the chest of Jesus. He heard the heartbeat of Almighty God in the flesh. He was so trusted by Jesus that at the cross, John was given the care of Mary. He didn't give that to Peter. He gave that to John. So the very one that he trusted the most, that was the most familiar with him, if you will, when he saw the resurrected Christ, he fell as a dead man. That's the Jesus that you and I are serving right now. You need to get that picture. We need to begin praying, Lord, teach me to fear you. Let me have that Isaiah moment. Let me see you as you really are. And when I see you as I really as as you really are, I end up eating carpet. I end up falling before you and bowing before you and worshiping you. <clears throat> Because I have no strength. I could not stand. Whenever we have that kind of experience, there's also this trust issue because Jesus touches John and then John can stand up. From the time that the fear of the Lord is established in us, we realize that our only strength comes from the strength that he gives us. We've we've seen this before as, as Abraham bows before Melchizedek. Yeah. <clears throat> it's called Shacha in the Hebrew. To bow down low and worship. And if you see the pattern of what God said, he said, we enter his gates with thanksgiving, we enter his courts with praise, but we enter the Holy of Holies. Bow down low in worship. Shacha. We cannot stand. Moses could not stand in the presence of God. He had to take off his shoes. He was on holy ground. And he had to, what? He said, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. Crouch down. Shacha, bow down low. We've taken in this concept of praise and worship, and we've moved it to entertainment. When really the concepts of Hallel, jubilant praise, Zamar, praying with instruments, ta-da, thanksgiving with our hands. But we never seem to move into that seventh part, which is the worship part, the shacha. Abraham says to his servants, wait over here. My son and I are going over here to worship. 
Now he very well knows he's going over there to slay his son. Then we're to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. That's our spiritual act of worship. It's sacrifice. Yes. Sacrifice out of fear of the reverent fear of the Lord. An offering of my complete self to God by bowing down low before him. Isaiah 1 through 5, he was, he was great. What was it that he was so out of order, so out of line that in chapter 6 all of a sudden he finds himself face to face with God and realizes that he is a man undone. He's on a, because he was, yes, in his strength, yes, a powerful message, but now he realizes, that, whoa, it wasn't by instruction, it wasn't by direction. Because now that God's cleansed him and he asks him the question, who shall I send? He now feels because he's been cleansed. He's now in right standing after prostrate, bowed down low, touched by the cold. He says, now send me. And boy, did he send him. Yeah, he did. For our watchword of the hour is both the fear of the Lord and personal holiness. Uh, in fact, one of the things that uh, we need to realize even about the armor of God in Ephesians 6, Paul goes into this whole teaching about putting off the old man and then putting on Christ because the armor of God cannot go where the character of Christ has not been established. And we have a lot of people claiming to do spiritual warfare, but they're out there running around in their BVDs if they're lucky, wondering why they're getting wounded. When I take a look at the snippet theology that so many have been fed and the way that our overall seminaries are pumping out uh, textbook illustrations and textbook ex exegesis and textbook hermeneutics and uh, the ones I speak to say, yeah, I took Hebrew, but it, you know, I, I got the one year, but I, it, I you know, I, I focused in, in the Greek. And I said, that's great. So you've read the Septuagint. No, I've just studied the Gospels and the New Testament. Well, wait a second. So, okay, love the Greek, great, but why not use it to navigate the entirety of Scripture if you have that as, as a gift? I don't have any Greek. I, don't have, I, have, I have zero, not zilch, never. Uh, not in my lifetime. It's all been Hebrew. So I can look at the Hebrew translation of the Septuagint by the reverse engineered process, which is what's been done. You've now, well, we can now figure out, okay, this is what you translated this to, okay, because we have the Hebrew, we can then translate the New Testament from Greek into Hebrew using the same methodology that was used to translate the Hebrew to the Greek. Reverse engineer it so I can have a Hebrew Bible that's Genesis to Revelation. Okay? and recapture the word pictures and the, the non-second language references. And that's what lots of this imaging, imagery has been boiled down to uh, in the book of Revelation. It's all Old Testament Hebrew. They're Hebrew writers, they have a Hebrew mind. Okay. They're using a ling linguistic tool that's available to them because that's what people read. But it's not how they thought. They thought this imagery. They thought this, this Hebrew mind. And so to sh throw off the idea that the gospel is purely contained within Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is completely bogus. Yeah. Genesis 22 is the entire crucifixion of Jesus, point for point, every point. 
And without Genesis 3.15, we don't even have a Jesus. We don't have a seed of the woman. <laughs> we don't have any of that. And so it's imperative that people stop and go back and look, especially, and the way the Hebrew Bible is set up, it's the five books of Moses, then it is the prophets, then it is the writings. In the Christian Bible, you have it in a completely different order. You have the writings and then the prophets. So you have to go back and forth because you don't know who's talking to who. In the Hebrew Bible, it makes it very, very clear that if you read it this way, in this order, you'll understand exactly what the context of what the prophets are speaking to and what the writings are amplifying and seeing the entire setting. And they end differently. The Christian Bible ends with Malachi, which ends with a curse, and the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, ends with Second Chronicles, which is a blessing. So, so much has been done to twist and turn and so subtle that a lot of this is missed in one word, two words, three words make all the difference in the world. The same way the translation that you and I just talked about where it ended in truth. Two words that were omitted that add so much power. Yeah, we, we need to realize that translation is limited to one's own paradigm. And uh, and so, they, you know, I think they did a great job. Of course, you know, when the King James, especially the King James was written, Hebrew was almost a lost language. And in fact, it was the Reformation that actually helped kind of resurrect uh, Hebrew, especially within academia. And so they, they were limited in, in, in their own paradigms. Uh, that, that's why it's good to keep digging uh, you know, and you don't, and guys out there, we, you don't have to be able to speak Hebrew. Mm -hmm. There, there are many wonderful lexicons, and if you take the time to just open up, you know that what what Eric shared, I missed because I didn't take the time this morning to examine the Hebrew. Within that, I would have said, hey, they they missed they 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 missed the point of it. Not maybe within their mindset that the only way that you can truly trust in God is to be in truth. But yet the prophet took the time to add that in truth because of all the error that was going on within Israel. Amen. Amen. Always a wise, insightful word from our good friend, Dr. Michael Lake. You can go to kingdomintelligencebriefing.com, sign up and follow him and get the briefings, watch the briefings. They are all revelatory and his books, each one of them. If you want to know what your assignment is, if you read uh, in uh, Peter, he tells you that you are called to be a royal priest. Something in the natural that can't happen. You can't be a Levite and a Judite at the same time, but yet, God does that in such a supernatural way that he anoints you and appoints you as a royal priest. And it's available to every single believer to answer that call and to be a part of the kingdom priesthood in these last days. Dr. Michael Lake, thank you for an empowering word this morning, for giving us great insight into this fatness, this spiritual fatness that's going to break this yoke and it's our individual responsibility to grow in the admonition of the Lord. I thank you for that. God bless you, my friend. God bless you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. We're going to take a short break and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth. The truth.